All right, good evening, everyone. I hope you all can hear me fine. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, before we get started, I would like to ask that I'm going to cover a lot of information tonight. Hopefully, it's going to answer a lot of questions that you have. I also have a question and answer document at the end of this presentation that will go through a lot of the questions that people asked um, Mrs. Hagenboo when she presented yesterday. So as we go through the presentation, if you have a question, please feel free to um, put the question in the chat box and you can send it to um, Mrs. Mead and we'll end up collecting those questions and then I'll create a document that will share the answers to those questions as best we can as we move forward. The topic of today is reopening our school building to welcome kids back. As we found out in the last week, the governor has allowed us to bring students back under some pretty strict um, requirements to keep safety. And you're here tonight because you are an incredibly important stakeholder of our school. Um, you are the, the kids, the parents, our community, which is what we live for. So that collaboration and working together is our shared responsibility to do the best possible for our kids. Um, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go through pretty quickly because Mrs. Hagenboo went through this um, yesterday. Uh, I just wanna mention it to you. And if you would like to watch her entire presentation, it is on the website and you can go through and she'll, she goes into more detail in each one of these slides from the big picture district office. So I just wanted to remind parents that everything leading up to this point has been a rather large undertaking where we've taken a lot of information, um, questions and feedback from the community. Um, the steering committee here represents our um, administration and, and maintenance and um, all of the, the, the services that work for our kids. Our planning template, we started meeting early July. Our steering committee met. We had focused planning throughout July. Our school improvement plan met. Team, we had our parent presentation on the 28th. Um, the Board of Health and Safety Committee met on the 29th. Our reopening plan was submitted on July 30th. So all of this is really fresh. All followed with the governor's announcement on August 7th. So New York continues to do well, and we wanna keep it that way because we want our kids in school. Everything that we've done has been driven through our, our mission and vision. Community-centered, collaborating, critically thinking, problem solving, how we can make our school the best place for our kids under these circumstances, and communicating that to you as our school community. The guided principles we used as we went through this, ensuring the health and safety of our students, supporting the mental health and wellness of our students, staff, and families, prioritizing high quality instruction, providing equity of instructional access, communicating clearly and consistently with student, staff, families, and community members, and continue to collaborate with flexibility and an ever-changing world. Boy, is this an ever-changing world. Ms. Hagenboo yesterday said this, is, this happens once every 100 years, and that's a, that is pretty much right. I've never seen anything like this in my time on this earth either. But the good part is we got this. We're gonna make this awesome, the best possible for our kids. Throughout this presentation, I'll be focusing on these nine specific um, areas as we go through, but I'm gonna do it through the lens of what it's gonna be like for your child as they come to school. All of the resources we had to use to create this plan um, the New York State Department of Health, 
the New York State Education Department. And in particular, the New York State Department of Health, because their requirements are very specific. We have to have a phase in plan for the number of students and faculty and staff we can have to return in person. We have to ensure appropriate social distancing. We have to have a plan for face coverings at what time. And we need to be able to clean and disinfect the building on a regular basis to keep our entire physical plant safe. Transportation. When we're on a bus, face coverings have to be worn at all times. Appropriate social distancing whenever is possible. Food service. We need to come up with procedures for on-site and remote service for our families. So even when they're not physically in school, we need to provide nutrition. Screening procedures and mandatory health screenings for all, including temperature checks. School health offices being isolated in a safe area in which um, anyone who has a symptom of COVID-19 can be quarantined for further evaluation and decision making. And contact tracing. This was one question someone had asked yesterday in um, Mrs. Hagenboo's presentation. Basically, contact tracing just means if someone ends up being positive of COVID-19, we can then go back and trace where that person has been and the contacts that person has had and share it with the health department so that we can then reach out to anyone who may have been exposed. So signing into the building, signing out of the building, all of those things allows us to know who was here and when and who showed symptoms, if anyone shows symptoms, hopefully no one. We also took a lot of feedback from our community. Our steering committee, 12 members, administration and management services. We had 57 advisory members. We had a school improvement team with parents and students. Uh, our faculty and staff has been surveyed and met with, and we've been reaching out to them with over 104 responses. Our parent survey garnered 494 responses, and our student survey garnered 173. So this has been a truly collaborative process in which we want all stakeholders actively engaged and aware of what we're doing. So what are some of those health and safety procedures that we're talking about? Now we're gonna start getting into a little bit more of that detail. Each part of our processes in the building when we start school are gonna be all focused around these six areas. Health checks, health and hygiene, face coverings and protective, um, personal protective equipment, social distancing, cleaning, disinfecting, and management of ill persons. So everything is going through that lens to take care of our entire school community. So starting off with our building procedures for adults. So to the left of the screen, you'll see our daily self-screening tool. Every single adult that enters this building is gonna have to attest that they haven't tested positive, they haven't knowingly been in contact with someone, they haven't experienced any symptoms, including a temp over 100 degrees, they have not traveled internationally to a widespread community of where COVID-19 is an issue. So every time an adult comes to enter the school, we've limited our points of entry, um, other than when students enter, and I'll explain that in a little bit, um, all adults enter the building must take their temperature. There's a no-touch thermometer at each entrance and attest to the self-screening assessment tool. Any person who has a 100 degree or higher temperature will not be allowed to enter the building. All persons must wear a mask in the hallways, common areas, and any other place in which they cannot socially distance at six feet or more. As we move into the school year, uh, I believe you would understand that we're gonna have to really limit all the visitors in the school to keep as few people in the school building who do not need to be here as possible. So essentially our building will be on lockdown for students, faculty, staff, and essential services only. Now, should we have a COVID positive case? Um, you're gonna hear this answer a lot to a lot of your questions. The Department of Health will be the ones guiding us in our next steps. So 
you'll notice as we go through things, when we ever have a question about the health and safety of our folks, we're gonna go to the Department of Health and they are gonna guide us because they are the professionals in dealing with this area. As for students, so our students, must wear a mask in the hallways and common areas and on any other place where they cannot socially distance at six feet apart. So it's the same rules as the adults. Now, we are gonna ask some help from our parents and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But parents will be asked to self-screen their child on the Camp El Savona school app and I'll show you that in a minute. Every child that comes into the building is gonna, have, is gonna be screened with a temperature check. Now, if you look up in the upper right hand of your screen, you'll see a, a, a person holding a fist and they're holding it over a little black box looking thing. That is gonna be installed at three of our entrances in our building for students when they come in the school. So when a student comes in, they're gonna pass, pass their hand underneath this device. The device is just gonna blink green if, their temperature is below 100, it's gonna blink red if it's above 100. If it's above 100, then we will have the nurse screen the student and recheck them with a very reliable temperature. And then the nurse will make a decision based on that and talking with the child, whether the child would be sent home or not. Um, based on the symptoms that present. So our, our nurse in the elementary building is gonna be the one who is gonna be that, that final health professional who, who screens a parent. Now, more on our health and safety procedures and how we're going to teach our children. This is the most important part. And the thing that makes me really excited about our school is we have been working on what, what in education lingo we'll call a multi-tiered system of supports for our kids, not only social emotionally and also academically. So we created a whole tiered system of teaching kids behavior. This is no different than our ROARS, except we're gonna call it pause. Put on a clean mask, always practice safe distance, wash your hands and sanitize. So you'll notice we have two, two posters that will be around our school, along with a lot of other posters from the Department of Health reminding us of, of how to be safe. And, um, and each one of them is meant to connect with either the primary or the intermediate level kids. We always protect themselves by practicing pause. So our teachers have created lesson plans where when our kids come to school, we're gonna be able to explicitly teach them what it means and how to safely put a mask on and take care of it. How to, in a kind, good manner, practice safe distancing. How we wash our hands constantly and how we sanitize and clean the areas around us. It's the idea of showing respect, taking ownership of our behavior, having a positive attitude, being responsible, and being safe in our school. For teaching and learning, our plans. Um, if those of you who watched Mrs. Hagenboo's presentation yesterday, you know that we're starting school on a hybrid model. This means some students will attend in some days and learn remotely in others. Uh, it, follow, it allows staff to implement all of the required health and safety protocols uh, on school buses and within school buildings. As I continue into the details of this, I'll explain how that works. The hybrid model will also allow students to transition back to school by practicing and becoming comfortable with the new social distancing and masking regulations. We chose this plan, we as in our entire school community as we gathered information, because we confidently feel we can bring students back in the safest manner possible and also engage them in deep, rigorous, and relevant instruction and allow them that social emotional support our kids need. Now, the hybrid model, we're slowly getting into more of the, the details here. The elementary school day is gonna start at 7.40 in the morning 
with all of our faculty and staff reporting to work, and at the same time, our students will be able to start entering the building. Between 7.40 a.m. and 8.05 a.m., students will be entering the building, and we're gonna shoot it trying to start instruction at 8.05 a.m. So the start, the technical start of the school day we're gonna look at is at 8.05 a.m. Our dismissal time is gonna be a little earlier than last year. At 2.25 p.m., primary students dismissed, 2.27 intermediate students with the buses leaving around 2.40 p.m. Our teachers in a critical, critical time are going to be able to have some time at the end of the day to collaborate with one another, prepare lessons, and um, attend to their students remotely at the end of the day also. There's a lot of reasons why we flipped the schedule. If you'll notice, this is actually the hours that the high school ran last year. Um, we did this specifically um, to make busing work and to allow the high school to be able to pull off um, a, basically a completely new schedule that they've worked really hard to do so that they can continue meeting the instructional needs of all of their students in the high school too. So there's been a lot of collaboration between the high school and the elementary to make this work. More details of what the hybrid model will look like. On Monday, all students will be in remote learning. The teachers will be at school. They will be planning, they will be holding um, small groups, recording lessons, holding whole group Zoom lessons with students, and really setting up rigorous learning for the week. Then students will be in school two days, either Tuesday or Thursday, and we're gonna call that the red team, and or Wednesday and Friday, and we're gonna call that the blue team. We have to take attendance for every single day, Monday through Friday. We're working on a model that we can do to be able to take attendance for students even when they're in the remote learning capacity. That's actually one of the things our teachers and I are going to talk about this Thursday um, as our teachers are really excited to get to school a little bit early to start planning the best they can. This will create a half capacity system. So if a class size is normally 20 students, there's gonna be 10, around 10 students in the class at a time. This will diminish class sizes enough to allow for proper social distancing so a child should be able to sit at their desk and take their mask off and engage in learning if the student is comfortable with that. It'll also allow our teachers to really focus deeply in their lessons and when the students are in school, attend to them even more meaningfully than we normally do. Our schedule is still gonna be the same type of schedule. It's still gonna be an ABCD schedule, but it's gonna be rooted in Tuesday through Friday. Since we are looking at 50% of our kids, it's going to take a total of two Tuesday through Friday loops for them to go completely through the schedule. That will make a lot of sense when we get the schedule out to everyone um, and how their students are gonna be at school and attend in their specials and um, their learning. Hey, Mr. Anderson, just a quick question for sure. maybe most folks looking at what you just presented. If their student is in a Tuesday, Thursday group and the first day of school is actually September 8th um, versus the kids who are in a Wednesday, Friday group, will, will their first day of school actually be Wednesday, September 9th? I believe that's what we're going to do. Um, I think we'll, we'll, cause we have to establish some norms that first, first couple weeks of school. I know that we are talking as an administrative group. If we can find a way to engage kid, engage the Wednesday, Friday kids, when, uh, yes, the Wednesday, Friday kids, I think we will, but um, they're physically attending school the first day would be the Wednesday. Thanks. So specifically, what will a day at school look like for our students? Well, it's all gonna start before school. And um, it's gonna be up to our parents to check their child's temperature. And if your child does have a fever of above 100 degrees, we're gonna ask to please, stay, please keep them home. Um, and then confirm your child is being free of COVID symptoms on the school app. 
So you'll notice to the left, there's a little school app thingy. If you take out your phone and if you go to the Google Pay Store and you look up Camp El Savona CSD, you'll see a specific app on your phone that will come up. I'm gonna show it right up to the camera there. It looks like our little panther head. When you log into that, it'll give you, you'll have to register. Once you do that, you'll be able to, it's gonna take the place of a lot of the other communication devices we used before, so it's in one spot. It's going to allow you to do a COVID check-in. It's gonna allow you to check any of the news through the school. It's gonna allow you to access our newsletters. It's gonna allow you to be able to text message and um, message your child's teachers. So there's a lot that's, gonna, that's coming with that that we're learning. So we're pretty excited about that as we learn it and teach it. Lastly, please make sure before you drop your child off at school or put them on a school bus, they have a face covering. Then when they get on the bus, what will that look like? Well, um, the hybrid model, one of the main focus about areas with it was to get less kids on the bus so they can be safe on the bus. We are looking at putting one student per seat um, and kind of meeting in the middle based on the most extreme measure of social distancing versus pre-COVID busing. So, our idea is other than a family unit, so people that live in the same household, they'll be able to sit in the same seat. Everyone else, we, our transportation folks and Sarah Burgess and, and Lisa Nichols and that crew over there has spent hours and hours going through every bus route to be able to figure out how to change and tweak them so that we're gonna, so that we don't have more than 22 kids on a bus with some flexibility with family units. According, um, looking at it, every student will have to wear a mask on the bus. So we wanna get our kids used to the idea that that's gonna happen. You have to have a mask on the bus. They're not letting you on the bus without a mask. If you forgot yours at home for a day, you'll be provided one to wear. We're gonna load the buses back seat first and unload first seat first. So that keeps less um, travel between people. Um, we will also have the bus windows open whenever temperature permits to increase air circulation. Um, that's actually been shown to decrease um, kids getting sick. There's, there's, there's definite research based on that. Buses will be cleaned and sanitized following each run. And we're gonna ask folks that when you're waiting at a bus stop and boarding, please make sure you're keeping social distance from the people around you or, or wearing a mask. Two changes that we have for this school year that parents are gonna really have to work with us and understand is that parents can have their students transported on the bus. That's what we do, we get kids to school. But that transportation has to be consistent. You have to have one pickup point in the morning and one drop-off point in the afternoon. There cannot be bus changes this year. Um, that does not allow for um, us to know how many kids are gonna be on a bus. We can't then uh, move and change bus routes and it's, it is completely about safety. So please, as you're talking with your family, if you need to, to use a school transportation, please get it worked out that there is one spot your child will be dropped off every single day and there's one spot your child will be picked up at every day. The only difference is if something changes and you're picking your child up from school because that doesn't change a bus. So um, that would be the only, the only change that we would have. Also, as was shared with pre-kindergarten parents during screening, um, due to the age of our pre-K kiddos and having to put them in car seats and things, um, the school will not be transporting trans transporting for pre-kindergarten children for this school year. Now, what's the morning gonna look like for our kids? One huge change is we're gonna flip the bus drop off and the parent drop off. Um, knowing that, that we will have a lot of parents dropping their kids off and we always are at about 
capacity or a little more at the 226 entrance um, when we have about 40 minutes for parents to drop off. The drop off window is going to be a little shorter. It's going to be about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So we're, we're flipping where parents drop their kids off. So parents will actually go in the, the regular bus loop around the front of the building. We're going to have um, two entrance places. If you look, one is going to be by the library, the main entrances by the library. And we're going to ask that most of our intermediate level students go there. Then we're going to have our primary kids. We're going to ask parents to do your best to drop them off at the small gym. Now, it's completely okay if there's a the sixth grader who's walking in with his kindergarten um, sister and she's scared and he comes in, that's going to be totally fine. But the reasons for separating that, the reasons for separating that are to allow for breakfast. And I'm going to show that to you in a minute. The bus buses are going to drop off at the 226 loop, dropping off three to four buses at a time. Since we are looking at half capacity, we should be able to do that well. There'll be screening parts, there'll be screening temperature at each of these entrances for students. Our special needs run entrance will still be in the back by the McCoy um, parking lot and the teachers, um, teaching assistants and aides in those classrooms will be doing the screening with our special needs students. when they enter the building. So breakfast, one of the biggest concerns was in the past, we've normally had a whole group of kids wait in the cafeteria, another whole group wait in the gym. That's not gonna work now. So we had to think of a way to change things. So when the students enter, um, third through sixth grade is gonna pick up their breakfast on the way to their classroom. So if you're dropping off your child, um, and they hit, they come in through the library entrance, they're going to come in, take a right. There's going to be a breakfast kiosk with um, two breakfast choices sitting there um, for them to grab their breakfast and then just head right to class following the arrows. If they're dropped off by a bus, we're going to have the same thing. They're going to come in the 226 doors, they're going to grab their, their breakfast, and then three, four, third, fourth, and fifth grade, it's gonna continue down the hallway and right to class. Sixth grade is gonna take a left and go right up to class in the sixth grade hallway. This keeps more of a consistent flow and a safe flow within the school. Pre-K through two, we'll be training our teaching assistants and aides to deliver their breakfast to them so that they'll then um, not have to worry about trying to carry a breakfast in their book bag and all that kind of stuff because the little ones struggle with that a little bit more. Lunch. Um, our lunch menu will be, will be more limited than it normally is. We'll still have hot choices and things like that. Um, at this point, our plans aren't completely solid, but we're looking at um, having lunch delivered to the classrooms and eating their classrooms in pre-K, K and one um, with food delivery. Two through sixth grade will be some combination of eating in their classrooms and eating in the cafeteria. Um, if you look at the picture, you'll notice that our cafeteria tables have been kind of split in half and we'll be able to have two kids at each table and we'll be keeping obviously those things six feet apart. We can get about 50 kids in our cafeteria at once. We feel safely in talking to Mr. Machuga and looking at the square footage, um, but we're, gonna, we're looking at some type of, of um, system like that. Teaching and learning, what we're really here for. The whole deal. Um, we've, get, we've gotten some flexibility from the state. Um, we're focusing on our most critical standards to teach kids. We're going, we're going to go deep. We're going to have smaller class sizes to really work well with our kids as we go. We're going to have that intervention and that multi-tiered system of supports. So here are the challenges we ran into. Our vision and our beliefs, we want our kids engaged in, in, in real life, rigorous, good learning. 
But the challenges we, we genuinely faced was, we've got to provide hybrid in-person learning. We've also at the same time concurrently have to provide remote learning when those kids aren't physically in school. There will be a choice for parents who are just feeling very, very worried about sending their child back to school where they can do 100% remote learning. We also have to look at, well, what about a student who is getting tested and needs to be quarantined for 14 days? Uh, um, if something plays out, we have to be able to fluently educate all of our children. We need to maintain our instructional support through our, our response to intervention system. We need to maintain our, our PBIS ROAR structure um, of, of meeting our children's social emotional support and continue to provide CSC and 504 services for our students. So this is the, the big focus, how can we make this work? So right now, as we continue to work and we will continue to work and change and modify this plan as we learn, we're going back to what our kids are gonna do. So what, how, how might this look like? What might it be? So on Mondays, whole class Zoom, the teachers, um, has all of the kids together, both the red team and the blue team. They're sharing their learning for the upcoming week. They're given assignments and expectations. The special areas may have them submitting um, some, some journaling of things that they've been doing in project-based learning. Um, and the teachers will be planning and recording their ELA and math lessons for the week. When kids are physically in school, teachers are gonna be checking and reteaching the learning that they were on in remote lessons, then jumping into the new learning and teaching those lessons deeply. There's gonna be lots of small group learning and, um, and community and family feel in the classroom. When kids are in remote learning, um, the teachers are gonna be posting their lessons on Seesaw in the digital classroom for pre-K through two, three through sixth grade in Google Classroom will also require the completion of certain online learning programs. For example, like iReady. One of the biggest things that we are gonna always, always push our parents and kids to do because it's just the, one of the best ways to learn is read, read with your child, have them, them be creative, write stories, read every type of genre you can read with your child. That time you spend with them and read with them is just so huge. And we're going to work at using as little paper as possible, knowing that there's going to be more paper and pencil stuff in the primary. As we work into the intermediate and into the high school, paper is going to be used less and less because we are in a digital world. Instruction in the classrooms. Students' desks will be six foot apart. Special area class teachers will be coming to the students and teaching them in their classroom so there's less transition. Phys ed classes will be held outside as much as possible and will focus on more individualized and healthy activities while making time for students to play and have fun. I know that our entire region is looking to get all the phys ed teachers together to talk about how they can do the best job they can for their kids. Recess is going to be on more of a strict schedule, um, allowing sanitized sanitation of the playground equipment. Um, Within reason, we will be, we will be um, having kids taught how to be socially distanced, how to quickly put a mask on if they're close to kids, and that's that pause, teaching kids pause. Dismissal will be 225 for pre-K through second grade and 227 for three through sixth. Buses will be looking at departing at 240. We're gonna continue the walker's room in the cafeteria knowing parents that masks will be required when you come to pick up your child. That last critical portion of the day will be for our teachers to wrap up the day, follow up with students they need to follow up with, plan, and prepare for the next day. For technology, we will be maintaining the use of laptops. Um, we are working on getting cases for them to make them a little more secure when students have them. The laptops are going to be an option for parents to bring them. There will be a contract a parent needs to sign to make sure they take care of the device. And if it's abused or mistreated, they'll have to pay for the re repair of the device. Um, again, we will continue with iPads and students in the primary. Um, 
here is one of the things that the district in trying to, that's that fiscal responsibility part, trying to make sure we're using all of our resources well. With kids being in school two days a week, um, at this point, the school would not be providing hotspots for families. One of the reasons is we're gonna make it part of our routine for students that don't have internet at home to upload the videos onto their laptop so that they can have access to it when they're offline also. So if we start looking at it in a bigger schedule, um, I really liked this weekday schedule that, um, that was Ms. Hagen Boo used yesterday. Um, if you see the school building, that's when kids, you're, the child's officially in school. When you see the computer, that's when they're remote learning. You'll notice that there's a white team that I haven't mentioned really yet. And that'll be for uh, parents who may choose to say, I just want my child to be at home in remote learning, not coming physically to school. I'm not comfortable with that yet. And I'll give more information on that in just a minute. Now, if we look at what that schedule might look like and how they might be engaged, here's an example of a student who's on a red team. So they'll be in person on Tuesday, Thursdays, Wednesday, Friday, and Monday, they'll be in um, virtual learning and remote learning. So as we, we can see, this is just more of a, um, those of you who want a visual for what the, each day could look like for our students. Trying to educate the whole child, focusing on our core subject areas, making sure our instruction is deep for our kids. Now, when we spoke about the 100% virtual model, this Thursday at 5.30, there'll be an informational Zoom meeting for those that are interested in this. So if, you, if you're sitting at home and you're, just, you're worried to send your child to school and you're like, you know what, I think I might want them just to be in online learning. Um, some of the criteria is a parent has to have reliable internet, um, they have to commit to virtual instruction for a minimum of a marking period. So um, we're going to do it marking period by marking period. That way there isn't a huge flux of kids coming in and out because the, our hybrid model is going to take, take a lot of work from our folks. Um, they've got to be able to provide daily adult support. Um, in this model, students will be assigned a teacher, so they will be part of a class participate in daily instruction and complete all assignments and have, um, they're not going to have a lot of in-person contact with school personnel for instruction. Um, all of it's going to be online or virtual, which is the reason why a parent would want to choose that. Um, if you are interested in being part of that presentation, please email um, Chris Gill, who is our, our Director of Curriculum Instruction. Her email is down there at the bottom, uh, C-H-G-I-L-L at cscsd.org and she will get you information about that presentation this Thursday at 5.30. So if you did choose a, co a complete remote learning example, this is what it would, would look like very similar to um, a student who is going to be home all the time. They would have pre-recorded ELA and math lessons and class, class um, work to submit in a digital classroom. They would continue with the same types of supports and programs that we have at school, like for example, iReady, RAS Kids, iExcel, depending on the grade level. Some of those same activities, um, reading at home, writing, um, engaging in all work that is sent home from the school with a contact support person at school to be there to help students when they start to struggle. Now, one of the big questions people are asking is, well, how did we build class lists and what team am I actually on? So this was a tremendous, a tremendous thing we did. Um, it started with listening to busing because not only do we have to take 800 and some kids and split them evenly to have small enough class sizes, but we also have to look at our bus routes, making sure that we can keep a limited number of students on the bus, while at the same time we were committed at keeping family units together, so people at the same address that lived together. 
So the red team kids will come to school Tuesdays and Thursdays. The blue team will be Wednesday and Friday. Um, looking at how this has played out, it is very difficult mm -hmm. to move anyone around. So we won't be able to take parent requests on which days children attend. Um, and it is, it is kind of, um, it's just, it's, it's very impossible for us to be able to do that because once we start moving some people, it makes it imbalanced. And um, this was the best, most fair way we could do it. So when will you find that out? A mailing is going out, it actually went out today. So if you keep checking your mailbox, um, that'll be coming to you. It'll, it will be able to show you what your child's homeroom teacher is. It's gonna tell them what team they're on. And then a last transportation request for us to know we have everyone going where they need to go to one pickup in the morning, one drop off in the afternoon. Now going through that whole list, um, there's one thing that I didn't um, kind of talk about yet, and that's our, our, our special needs students, our CSE students and students with IEPs. And I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. DeCamp, our Director of Special Education, to unmute and just walk, walk you through a little bit of, um, walk you through a little bit of how we're accommodating um, our students with special needs. Hi, good evening. So um, I put a few, I only have a couple of brief slides, but I do have my contact information on the third slide. So if you guys continue to have any questions specific to any kind of special education services or that are really specific to your child, um, I'm gonna encourage that you use that contact information that'll be on the third slide um, to get in touch with me and we can certainly work through that together. So what you see here, um, you will also be getting in a mailing. So every single parent that has a student with an IEP or a 504 will get this in a mailing this week. Um, and so it's, it's just going to share with you some of the, the general um, ways that we're going to continue to provide services to your kiddos. Um, so as you can see on the top, this is our guiding, one of our guiding principles of special education. We will continue to provide special ed services as written on the IEP to the fullest extent possible regardless of the model of instruction. So that's no matter if your child is 100% in person, um, if we ever can get there this school year, then it'll be that way, um, hybrid, or if they are remote um, or fully virtual. Um, New York State does offer some flexibility in service delivery, understanding that um, different students in different situations, um, that, those, that things might have to change a little bit for them. Um, another really key thing is what we learned from the spring is related services are very difficult to provide virtually. So what I mean by that is speech therapy, occupational therapy, PT, counseling, um, those will be offered in person to the fullest extent possible. So that's one of the really wonderful things about being able to have our students in school um, at least two days a week um, is that we can provide those services in person because we do know that that was very challenging in the spring. Um, students with disabilities who attend any special class programs, whether they're in our district or outside of the district, will follow the schedule and the model of instruction in that dis in the dis program. Um, hold on, the chat is just kind of right in my way. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't read. Um, so you'll be getting that communication from the district or the agency that provides that program to your child. Um, but one thing that is very key and important for you to know is that we will transport your child for those programs. So if they're going to another campus that is Monday through Friday, they will be transported Monday through Friday. Mr. Anderson, you can go to the next one. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Um, as we did in the spring, but even more so this year, we will continue to provide services, monitor progress towards those IEP goals, and communicate that progress to you. So no matter what the model of instruction that our district is in, whether it's in-person, hybrid, or remote, we will definitely continue those, those pieces. Um, the, the big key thing is we, as teachers in our district, will be evaluating every student's academic levels, especially as soon as we get them in person, and we will provide appropriate services to the student based on the individual student-by-student -student need and by their and by um, student-by-student -student basis. Um, the New York, when New York State talks about it, they say you consider all services in a kid-by-kid -kid basis. Um, so what that means is when we get those students back in front of us in person, 
they'll be doing they'll be doing um, benchmarking and assessing similar to what we do anyway um, and then determining if any changes need to be made for those students and parents you will be a part of that process um, and finally my last bullet point um, is that we will continue to collaborate with parents of students with a 504 plan to make sure that we're also helping to provide um, students with in, or with the parents especially about information regarding their modification and accommodation no matter what the model is that we are in oh. Next. so again like I shared um, here is my contact information with the extension and my email um, so please feel free if you have any specific questions you will be getting a mailing this week that has a lot of that information in it and it also has my contact info um, so don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions thank you Thank you, Mr. Camp. You're welcome. So speaking of what you can expect coming up, um, there's a letter in the mail. You might get it tomorrow. You might get it Thursday, um, informing you of your child's classroom teacher and which team your child is on. There's also a transportation request form. I'm going to ask, please, to return um, it to the office, email, or call the bus garage ASAP so that we can make sure that all the bus routes are accurate. There's also gonna be your emergency information card. Please make sure to complete that and return that as soon as possible so that we can have the most up-to-date information regarding your child too. Um, check the accuracy of your phone number and email so that the school can keep in contact with you. In a digital world, we send things out a lot via text and email. So we gotta make sure we got the accurate stuff. Now, um, questions and answers. I'm gonna go through these very quickly. But these were some basic questions that were asked yesterday. Um, masks and face co coverings, thickness of them. The school is not going to be analyzing and um, judging face masks. We just want to make sure a face mask is covering the nose and mouth. Medical exemptions for masks. We are working with the school um, physician to vet any requests that come in with a medical exemption. Um, if a medical exemption occurs, um, and the student is in school, they would, they would have to be at a six feet distance at all times. So um, if a student gets a medical exemption, um, it, it might be likely that they would go to full remote learning, um, to pay, depending on what the expectations are. Um, as for the school schedule, it will stay the same, um, even if there is a weather-related canceling or school closing, um, the ABCD day is going to stay rooted in a Tuesday through Friday. Um, there is a, questions about a disinfecting protocol of playgrounds. Maintenance will be on a schedule to spray and wipe down high touch traffic areas on the playground several times a day. Um, PE class and children with asthma. There's a parent concerned about that. Children will be allowed mask breaks and will not be required to wear a mask when six foot apart or 12 foot with high strenuous activity. The big thing is communicating with your teacher when you might need a break. Um, if a child is sick at school, do they have to be tested for COVID every time? That's not our call at school. If a student is sick, we're going to have you take them to the doctor. It's the doctor's choice whether they test for, for COVID and then the doctor will have a specific form to send back to the school letting us know when your child can come back to school. So that's a Department of Health and, and doctor thing. Um, nurse screenings. There was a question about um, uh, LPN at the high school and our registered nurse here in the elementary. Um, we're always gonna defer on safety. So if we have symptoms that are not reasonably easily explained um, of a child, we're gonna ask parents to take them to the doctor. Um, will testing be available? Well, there are several sites in our area that are providing free testing, like Walgreens and, and places like that. At this point, the school is not a testing site. If they come up with a quick test and the governor says something different, maybe that'll change, but that's where it is now. Um, if I keep my child home with a low grade fever, do they still need a doctor's note to return? Um, I think it depends on the fever and the circumstances related to the reason which would be something for you to talk with your, with your pediatrician. Um, will the school require students to take the vaccine once it, once it is available or require flu shots? Um, the school will do what New York law, state law tells them. That's not our decision at school. We, don't, um, we have to do what the Department of Health and the, the law tells us. So that will be, that's out of our, our purview to make a decision for school. 
What happens if there's a positive case in the classroom? The Department of Health will tell the school what to do. Um, what happens if a teacher is absent? We're gonna run the same protocols we have in the past. If a teacher is sick, we're gonna work to get that teacher a substitute with good plans to continue learning in the classroom. Um, some concern about what type of disinfectant the school will be used. Um, is it state re regulated? Um, we're using QT3 from Hilliard Corp. This is being used by many of the local schools also. And we're also using a, using a spray and go from a uh, company Vasco is also being used. The school has an MSD information sheet for all cleaners and disinfectants. Um, any um, parent employee can ask to see that to get more information. If a parent chooses to do 100% online, can my child come back to school when school fully reopens? Um, yes, we would, we would probably be doing it based on marking periods though. They'd finish a marking period and then be able to come back so that we're, we're at a really clean start. What happens if my child has a hard time breathing wearing a mask? Um, as I said before, students will be able to, to request mask breaks. Um, they must wear the mask appropriately though. Students will not be required to wear masks when sitting at their desks in their classrooms. One of the reasons why we chose this model was because we felt it was probably unreasonable to, to um, expect that every child um, from four years old up to 18 is gonna be able to wear a mask the entire day in the appropriate way. So we're working those things in throughout the school day. Um, cafeteria line, all students will be required to wear a mask and be safe. Um, questions about the fall musical, the school's committed to practicing and putting on the musical while practicing all safety protocols. What that will look like is gonna depend on what happens in our region and what the expectations are. If a parent wishes that their child wear a mask all day, will the teacher respect their wishes? Absolutely. There are gonna be some teachers that are gonna to choose to wear a mask the entire day, and that's okay. There's gonna be some kids that choose to wear a mask the entire day and their parents want them to. That is totally okay. This is about our comfort level to be safe with each other. Uh, focus on emergency drills. Um, we are making revisions to teach the appropriate response in a drill while not requiring to put students at risk. So for example, having Johnny um, be, show us how to, how to hide in a corner during a lockdown drill in a safe manner um, so that the other kids can see and practice, but not necessarily put their, each other at risk. If we were to have a real emergency though, the emergency trumps everything else. So if we did have a, an emergency where we had to evacuate the building immediately, every single person, human being in the school would mask up and we would get on buses and we would go and we would be as safe as we could responding to what is the emergency at the moment. Now, is there a timeline on how long hybrid learning will go? Well, the district will be looking at all options at the five week mark to make further decisions moving forward. Our goal is to get all kids back, but we can't do that until certain restrictions are lifted so that we can safely do it. That safety piece is always gonna be the most important thing. Now, if a student stays home and they're not feeling well, can they still attend remotely? Yes, I, I think it's gonna be based on how the student feels. Um, there's a possibility that a student might be quarantined for a period of time. If they are, absolutely. We want them, we want them connected in, in learning. That's why the hybrid model allows us to fluidly work back and forth for those students. Next week, a parent newsletter will be mailed home to all elementary parents with more specific information regarding the start of the school year. The newsletter will also be sent digitally to parents. Um, this meeting will also be sent to parents in a digital form too, as we prepare for school to start. I'm a parent too. I got a student in elementary, I got a student who's just going into the high school. I have to take my principal hat off every once in a while. And I have to think as, as, as a dad, in the meantime, what can I do as a parent to help my child? Well, I think teaching pause at home is a great start. Getting our students to feel comfortable understanding why we need to be a little bit physically apart, why we need to really wash our hands a lot, why wearing a mask is okay and it's fine. It's about keeping us safe. That has to become 
the norm for our students for now. And when we saw the pre-K kids come in for screening, they did such a great job. They don't know, they don't know the difference. So to them, it's becoming more regular. This is what we do to keep people safe. Um, when I think of the other part, the social emotional part, I can't help doing that without thinking about Mr. Rogers. And I think about how we've established our ROARS framework. And I look at our, our, our mind, taking care of our mind, body, heart, and soul. Our students, our children, they look up to us for how they feel about the world around them. If we show them hope, if we show them understanding, if we show them how we can do things we might not want to do, but we have to do it for the moment, we teach our kids resilience. And as, as, as Mr. Rogers says, when I was a boy and I'd see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words. And I'm always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. And that is the truth. And that is what we will do as a community. We will continue to support each other, continuing to grow. I know there's a lot of parents, myself included, that is trying to figure out, okay, my kids are remote learning. I work a full-time job. What do we do? Um, I know ProAction has created a, um, a, an outline to call to ask to help find child care services if folks are looking for that. And if there's any of you out there who are thinking of providing child care, there is some um, trainings and things that you can take um, to allow you to be able to do that. So um, this information, um, if, you are, if you're interested, there's a webinar um, providing child care in the home and what you need to know that is sponsored through ProAction. If you give them a call, they'll be able to, to set you up with that. You can also go to the ProAction website and they'll give you more information too. Beyond that, what are our next steps? Well, um, today we're all talking. <laughs> um, on the 13th, uh, if you're interested in just all online learning, there's an information ses session and I'd ask you to email that email, um, chgill at cscsd.org. Um, September, August 14th through September 8th, we're going to continue educating our staff, working with them to be ready. This Thursday, we're gonna have about a lot of teachers here that are gonna be working to help solve the problems we're still trying to figure out. But as I end this presentation um, and let you know that, that we're gonna take the questions you've asked in the chat feature and continue building a question and answer document, but I would say that um, as, we, as we wrap up tonight, this, always this. This is our school family. These are our kids. These are our teachers. And this is why we're here and this is why we do this. I wanna thank you so much for spending the time with me today. I will work very hard to answer questions people have um, after this. I do have to move on because Mrs. Mead's gonna be doing a high school presentation. And I know there's some of you that, that need to jump on on that. Um, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the school. Thank you, God bless, Panther Strong. I will see you later. <laughs>